Welcome to God's Word Only. This is Lesson 7. Lesson 7 is about loving everyone. Last time we looked at loving God, the first three commandments, these are the next seven commandments from 4 to 10. It has to do with loving our neighbor, and our neighbor is everyone that we come across. It doesn't really give the honor and the respect it deserves to commandments foreign four through 10 when we're taking it in one lesson. But this is just an overview so you can dig deeper in a little while later. The lesson seven is loving everyone. So that means that the issue we have to deal with is selfishness. Our selfishness does not make it easy to keep any of God's commandments, especially those where we are loving other people how we respect them, how we treat them. And so hopefully by the end of this lesson, we will see how this selfishness inside of us can be tampered down a bit as we look at what God has done for us. Now, just a reminder, we do go through stories, and this story is about the Good Samaritan, a familiar story with many of you. But just to remind you, the Good Samaritan is a story about a man who was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, a Jewish man. He was jumped by robbers, beaten up, and left half dead on the side of the road. A priest happened to walk by. A priest was the pastor back in those days. But this priest did not want to deal with the situation, so he crossed the road and passed by on the other side. Next, a Levite walked up. A Levite was the helper of the priest in the temple. But this Levite, too, did not want to deal with the situation. He crossed the road and passed by on the other side. Next, a Samaritan came up. A Samaritan was a half-Jew, half-Assyrian and because of this racial difference, there was also racial tension between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. In fact, during the time of Jesus, they wouldn't even talk to each other. They disliked each other so much. But this Samaritan saw this Jewish man on the side of the road, and he stopped, and he helped him up, and he cleaned his wounds, and he gave him water. And then he took him to a hotel, and he paid the hotel manager to take care of him. And the next day, he paid the motel man, hotel manager even more and said, if there is anything left that I would owe you, I will pay you on my return. The Samaritan went above and beyond the normal call of duty. He went above and beyond simply helping this Jewish man off the side of the road. He loved his neighbor as he loved himself. The story is a good summary of how we are to treat everyone that we come across in this life. This is loving people as the Lord has loved you. The Samaritan may not be a man that we can emulate all of the time, but it is certainly an example that we should strive for on a regular basis, and we're going to see that in the commandments to come. And remember, commandments number, numbers one through three had to do with loving your God. And now we are concentrating a little bit differently on loving those that we are around and those that are around us. And as a review, we want to talk about what the law does. Sometimes the law is a mirror. It shows us who we really are. It shows us our sinfulness. Sometimes the law is used as a curb. If you hit that curb with the wheel, with, with your tire of your vehicle, you know that you better get back on course or there are going to be serious consequences. That's how the law functions as well. And sometimes law functions as a ruler, a guide. It shows us the way we should go as Christians because we want to thank our Lord in every possible way. This last section, this ruler, is hopefully how we are regarding the Ten Commandments because we want to thank and praise our Lord. The fourth commandment is honor your father and mother. Now, if we're going to talk about parental authority, we get to talk about all kinds of authority in this world that we are supposed to follow. So I always start with 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority. Every authority would include parents, but it would also include our government, and it would also include people like pastors and teachers, our spiritual authorities. And so this has 
everything to do with the way we treat those above us in authority and everything we do and, and, and has everything that has to do with how we treat those over whom we have authority. The fourth commandment to do list would include honoring, serving, obeying, and respecting everyone in authority, whether they deserve it or not. There are plenty of people that don't deserve our honor and respect. It doesn't matter. This is the command that the Lord has given us to carry out on our own. What are we not supposed to do? We're not supposed to rebel against those in authority, dishonor, disobey, disrespect them, or abuse the authority that we have been given. Obviously, this is not an easy command to follow on either side. But it is an important command to follow because this is the start of how we are treating and loving other people. The toughest pill, pill to swallow in this particular commandment is from Romans. He who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. If we don't like a tax law, it doesn't matter. We must pay it. If we do not like a speed limit, it doesn't matter. We are supposed to follow it. If we don't like an individual, it doesn't matter. We are still supposed to respect them, honor them, and obey them. This is a tough pill to swallow, but it is something that the Lord wants us to do so that we can show our thanks and praise to him. Now, Jesus keeps this commandment perfectly as well. Here's an example of it in Luke chapter 2. Jesus went down to Nazareth with his parents. And was obedient to them. Jesus always obeyed his parents. He was always respectful. He was always honoring what they wanted him to do. Now we could have plenty of other passages where Jesus shows respect, shows respect to the governing authorities. And we can have passages that show that he did not abuse the authority that he had. But this will suffice for now that Jesus keeps this commandment perfectly. And then he gives you the credit for it. Moving on to commandment number five, it is you shall not murder. Notice that it is not you shall not kill. Some of you might be familiar with that, with the King James Version. The difference between murdering and killing is murdering is taking someone's life when you have not been given the authority to do so. Killing would be categorized as taking someone's life when you have been given the authority to do so. Examples of that would be the government and the death penalty. We see that in Romans chapter 13. Another example would be a soldier at war. He has been given the authority by the government to take a life in that instance. Another example might be if someone breaks into your house with a gun and you shoot them before they shoot you, that would be considered self-defense. So you have been given the authority in that instance to take someone's life. What are we supposed to do to keep the fifth commandment? Because we look at the fifth commandment and think, well, I've not murdered anyone. I don't plan on murdering anyone. So it should be relatively easy, right? Not so fast. Because if we're not supposed to murder that person we don't like, well, how are we supposed to treat them? That's when it gets a little more difficult. We are supposed to be kind, be compassionate, be considerate, and be forgiving for everyone that we meet, no matter how they treat us. That's not easy. And along with not murdering anyone, we are also supposed to not hate, not harm, not be mean, not disregard them and their needs and their wants and their wishes. This commandment is very difficult to keep. Even though on the surface it seems simple, it's not quite so simple when we get into it. How are we supposed to treat other people? This is how we treat other people as Christians. And when we don't, we sin against our Lord. The toughest pill to swallow, forgive each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. This is a fifth commandment issue. We are supposed to forgive everyone for everything and not hold it against them. That doesn't mean we forget everything. Sometimes we might not trust a person, but that doesn't mean we don't forgive them. Forgiveness is the fifth commandment. 
That's why when Jesus keeps the fifth commandment perfectly, we look at Luke chapter 22. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus says these words while he's hanging on the cross. An amazing act of grace and love by our Savior to show how willing he was to forgive those who were in the middle of murdering him. Commandment number six, you shall not commit adultery. Now, normally we use the word adultery when it comes to married couples. So we say something along the lines of he cheated on her. He committed adultery with another woman. Well, all that, although that is true, adultery doesn't just mean for those who are married. Adultery really is having a sexual thought, sexual words, sexual actions, sexual emotions with anyone that you're not married to. So it could be to single people committing adultery. So how are we supposed to keep this commandment? If we're not supposed to commit adultery, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to honor marriage, speak well of it, encourage other people to get married, to remain married. We are to refrain from acts or words or thoughts that are inappropriate in any way. And so what are we not supposed to do? Act or speak or think impurely about anyone that you're not married to. Treat your spouse poorly. Homosexuality would, would fall under this category too. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on homosexuality, but we will mention it very briefly. The Lord very clearly says in his word that homosexuality is against his will. So if there are two homosexuals that have indecent thoughts or actions for each other, that would be the same category as a man or woman having indecent thoughts or actions with each other outside of marriage. It's really the same sin. It's the same commandment, the sixth commandment. And homosexuality certainly is promoted and honored almost in our society today, not just because this is our, a society likes it, or society promotes it, doesn't make it right. Now, homosexual, if they are practicing homosexuality, if they're acting on their thoughts and their feelings, although that's not right, that doesn't mean we hate them, doesn't mean that we treat them poorly. We certainly want them to hear God's word as often as possible, and we love them just like we love anyone else who is acting or speaking or living in an ungodly in an unbiblical way. We want to help them as best as possible to understand what scripture really says. And that might just be a thought or a feeling that they're going to have to struggle with, with for the rest of their life. But just because it might be natural for them doesn't make it right. In fact, a lot of what is natural for us is wrong. We see that in the sixth commandment all the time. Just because it's natural, a natural feeling or a natural thought or a natural emotion doesn't make it right. Toughest pill to swallow here is from book, the book of Matthew. Jesus says, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. We can flip that around with a woman and a man too, but it's even the thought, even the feeling, even the emotion that would lead you into sin. So Jesus keeps this commandment perfectly as well. We have one, that's Jesus, who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Think of that even in the context of the sixth commandment. Jesus was tempted just like you were, and yet he never had an indecent thought or action, feeling or emotion, and he gives you the credit for it. Commandment number seven is you shall not steal. But if we're not going to steal what someone else has, how are we supposed to treat the possessions and the property of other people? Also, this also includes how we steal or not steal from God himself. And we're going to see that in a little bit. What are we supposed to do? Help others keep their property. Help others protect their property. Pay others back and be generous. So on the flip side, we're not supposed to be greedy, not misuse the property of others, and we're not supposed to fail to give back to our God. God tells us to give to him, give some things, give some money, give some time, give some effort to him. And so when we don't, 
we are in effect stealing from him. Now, how much are we supposed to give to the Lord? The Lord leaves that up to us. He says he loves a cheerful giver. Set aside whatever you want to give him, but give him something. Give him from your heart because he wants you to give to him for your sake. He doesn't really need your money. He doesn't need your property. He doesn't need any material blessings. He's given that to you already. But he does understand that when you give back to him, that is an act of trust and worship. And he wants that for you more than he wants it for him. The toughest pill to swallow in the seventh commandment, Jesus says, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. That's a generosity thing. That we are not greedy, that we are not stingy, but that we are constantly giving to people because we don't need anything else. Jesus in 2 Corinthians keeps this commandment perfectly. Our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Jesus was rich in heaven. He had everything. He created everything. He enjoyed everything, but he gave it up for a time so that he could become poor in this world. He had nothing, and eventually, of course, he died with nothing on the cross. So that you, through his poverty, might become rich. You are rich right now with the blessings he's given you, but you will be wealthy beyond imagination in heaven when you experience all the glories and the joys of paradise. Commandment number eight. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. This also is about any other words that you might ever say about anyone else. You can imagine how often this particular commandment is broken. So let's get into it. What are we supposed to do? Speak well of others, stand up for others, commend and encourage others, which means we are not supposed to gossip, tell lies, disparage others. Uh, This is a commandment that is broken quite a bit. We sin all the time with our mouths. And so the best policy is to keep your mouth shut. The less you talk, the less you are going to sin. Toughest pill to swallow here. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt doesn't mean sprinkling salt on something to make it taste better. Seasoned with salt really means to preserve with salt. They didn't have any freezers or refrigerators back then. And so they had to pack their meat and salt, kind of like beef jerky nowadays. We don't want anything that comes out of our mouth to be spoiled or rotten. We want it to be fresh. We want it to be full of grace. Whatever we say about anyone, whether it's to their face or behind their back. Jesus keeps it perfectly. When they hurled insults at Jesus, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Jesus never said a disparaging word against anyone. Even though he had to call people out for their sins at times, it was all out of love and for the good of their soul. The final two commandments we are going to put together because they all have to do with coveting. You shall not covet. Covet means to want something you can't have. So it's okay to want something you don't yet have. That's not anything wrong, but you're not supposed to want something you can't have. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be content, satisfied, thankful, and happy. We are not supposed to be greedy, jealous, or envious. This would all have to do with the ninth and the 10th commandments. And it has to do with what's in your heart. This sin might lead to other sins, but the sin of coveting, no one else can see. Even those things that reside inside can be sins against your Lord. In the book of Luke, we see that Jesus says a person's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Although that's what our culture says Anyone who is quote unquote successful means that they have a lot of material possessions, but that's not success according to the Lord. Success according to the Lord is ending up in heaven, whether you have a lot of stuff in this world or not. 
Jesus replied to the people around him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Jesus was content, wasn't greedy. He was satisfied with what he had and he had really nothing, but he wanted to give up everything for you. That is Jesus keeping the ninth and the 10th commandments perfectly. And of course, along with every other commandment, he gives you the credit. To the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, that's us, his faith is credited as righteousness. We believe in Jesus, that's credited to us as perfection, as his righteousness. It's an amazing act of our Lord once again. So even though we may still be selfish, we can continually to fight off that selfishness through praising our Lord. If we want to praise our Lord for everything that he has done for us, that selfishness goes away because we are more and more willing to do what the Lord wants us to do. And what does the Lord want us to do? To serve others, to help others, and to love others. Here's my information one more time. You can get on the forums. You can email me or text me individually if you would like to ask a specific question. Hope you've enjoyed this lesson. Please join us again for lesson number eight.